Okay, we shall uh, cover uh, just a few new topics today. It's pretty lightweight, in my opinion. And then, um, so, uh, so some lightweight material today in terms of new stuff, but we will review, um, I don't know, uh, a lot of this confidence interval hypothesis testing stuff. Um, because that's really where I think the heart of statistical inference lies. And so uh, we'll do that. Um, this week, your homework, if you go on the webpage, there's just a few problems from chapter 12, and they should be very easy, OK? But the, uh, your main assignment, which I'm not collecting, is to work through the practice final exam that I have posted, OK? So that's going to be your main homework assignment. Um, but I'm not collecting that. So. Um, but it's to your benefit, and so because next week during the uh, class I'm going to be going over uh, pretty much all the answers to the practice final exam, and so if you've worked through it, uh, you'll be able to follow along and ask questions and say, you know, why is it this and not this or whatever. Um, so uh, do that. Becca. Uh, I have a few examples of that on the practice final. Um, I don't want to give say too much more because then there will be like actual questions from the final <laughs> exam and stuff. So uh, things like that. Yes. No, I know the final exam is obviously going to help us a lot. But uh, is there like one example of like every kind of question we will be asked, or, or no? Like if we pretty get a, much. Pretty so if much. we get like a hundred on the practice, we should do fine on the final. Kind yeah, of thing? if you get a hundred percent on the practice final exam, uh, you are probably very well prepared for the final exam. Okay. So we can that, get that's assuming you've done the. You get a hundred percent like on your own yeah. without needing to go through the notes and things like that. So if you really understand. The if you practice, really understand the okay, stuff great. on the practice final. I think you're well poised for the, the final. Okay. And so yeah, that is, like, we can just uh, review the practice final as much as we can until we get it right. Yeah, I would, I would highly recommend that. Um, and then when I ask, like on the practice final and things like that, uh, there's some, you know, uh, a few questions like, you know, what, what is the interpretation? So the practice final is not multiple choice, so it's all just free response. It's just the questions. Um, so just make sure you get the, the phrasing correct on certain things, right? We always say we either reject the null or do not reject. We never say we accept or, or things like that. Uh, so let me, let me get. So there's a the final multiple choice also? Yeah, the final will be all multiple choice, and that's just uh, so I can get the grades done quickly, OK? Uh, let me get uh, Daniel. Uh, two questions. Um, one, is the same amount of questions as are on the uh, It'll be 50 questions, OK? And then um, also, is there any extra credit built in? Yeah, extra credit built in. So if you get all 50 questions right, you'll get 110%. Okay. You'll have, uh, yeah. j just under three hours, okay? Because we, uh, we'll get started probably just a few minutes after 7 o'clock, and then we'll end at 10 o'clock, okay? Yeah. And so when would we get the answer to the practice final? Next week, in class? Yes, in class I will go over all the answers to the uh, practice final. You know, in the, in the past, I haven't needed to, okay? In the past, I haven't needed to. So, um, in the past with the midterm, uh, there, there usually was a need for about five points-ish, okay? So, uh, so I did that in the past, I did that this time, okay? But in the past with the final exam, I've, it wasn't really necessary. Um, so, so, so probably not. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Oh, so there's going to be no extra credit. No, there, there is. There is. There is extra credit built in. So if you if you get all the questions right, you'll get 110 percent. I'm not going to do like additional points on top of that. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Will you send us like the up, updated? I will. So part? after I get all of these quizzes graded, okay, I will have your entire grade in the class so far, okay? Which is basically everything except for the, the final, final exam. And it will just say, if you want this grade, you need to get this on the final. If you want this grade, you need to get this. So it's, uh, it's about as detailed as I can yeah, no, make it. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. I will email 
you again, okay? I will email you again, yes. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about hypothesis testing, okay? Is chapter 12 or no? Uh, it's, it's like bits and pieces from chapter 9, 8 and 9, okay. a little bit mixed into it. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about when we move into chapter 12. Oh, yeah. So, so you, you said the final is like cumulative, right? It is cumulative. Okay. It, it's going to be like 80% stuff from chapters 8 and 9. Okay. Chapter 8 and 9 will cover about 80% of the final. All right. Um, and uh, the other 20% will come from like stuff from the midterm and before. Uh, but it's there's going to be no calculations involved, okay? So like on the midterm, you have to find the standard deviation by hand and stuff like that. This will ask more so like what what is what what is the definition of the standard deviation? Chapter uh, eight and nine specifically. Eight? Chapter eight and nine, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, not so much chapter seven because chapter seven, like to do well in chapter eight, you need to understand chapter yeah, seven. Yeah. But uh, chapter seven, there's not a whole lot in terms of questions okay. to ask. Okay. From a one to six, I'd say. Yeah, definition type questions. So it, it might be like, yeah, uh, what does the standard deviation measure? Anybody? Oh wait, I'm asking, asking us. Yeah, I'm asking you guys. What, what does the standard deviation measure? The, the, this is from the mean. The weirdness oh, yeah, level yeah, from yeah. the mean. How different it is from the mean, isn't it? Uh, no, that, that you're thinking of a z-score. Uh, oh. oh, a z-score is how many standard deviations? Sta z-score is how many standard deviations from the mean. The standard deviation itself is just how much spread exists in the data. Okay. How much? So that would, you know, something like that, right? Okay. Uh, Okay, so let's say we've got um, a, null, uh, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Okay, whatever this might be. P equals 0 0.30, P not equal to 0 0.30. Okay? And by the way, what kind of test are we doing here? Okay, two-tailed test. And how many samples and what kind of variable? One sample proportion. Okay, one sample proportion, <coughs> two-tailed test. All right, anyway, we go through all of our calculations. We get a test statistic. And I look this up in what table? Z table. Yeah, because it's proportions. I'm going to look it up in the Z table. And uh, so we do this, and we get a p-value. Let's say my p-value is 0.0417. And let's say my alpha is 5%. What is my conclusion and what does that mean? So your p-value is less than alpha. Okay, so what decision do I make? So the decision, because the p-value Is less than alpha, I reject the null hypothesis. Okay. What does it mean to reject the null hypothesis here? We accept the alternative. Okay, we accept the alternative. And okay, so I, I reject the null, I accept the alternative. <coughs> and I say what? I have evidence what? That supports the alternative hypothesis. <laughs> okay, I have evidence that supports. The, I have evidence that what? You only accept the null hypothesis. It is not equal to oh. the I have evidence that what? That the proportion in the population. Okay. Is not equal. to 30%, 0.30, okay? So maybe this is, you know, what proportion in the population uh, owns an SUV, okay, or drives an SUV? What percentage of drivers drive an SUV? 
and I say maybe it's 30%. Okay, we go through this process, I get a p value of 0 0.0417, and that tells me I have evidence that the proportion of people who drive SUVs is not 30%. If that, that part's okay so far, right? Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's mess with your mind a little bit. What if, or is it possible, is it possible that 30% of the population drives SUVs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just said I have evidence that the proportion is not 30%. So is it possible that the proportion is actually 30% in the population? No. no. Well, we according to the sample, it, no. everyone. Okay. So what? So I said I have evidence that the proportion is not thirty percent. Okay? So it's not thirty. But is it is it possible for the population? Oh yeah. To actually be. To actually have. Yes. So who thinks yes? Okay, who thinks no? Okay. Well, the answer is yes. What does it mean if the answer is yes? Uh, I mean, what does it mean if the population actually has a proportion of 30%? Why would I come to the conclusion that I have evidence that it's not 30%. Because that's what I said, right? Well, it's based off the sample. Yeah, it's, it's a, a possibility, but it doesn't mean it's true. It's not so probable, but probably, like, it's not so, um, I mean, it's not only outliers, maybe? Okay, I think we're saying some stuff here. Um, okay, so what, this is what, what must have happened then, okay, is that the population is really, has really actually has 30% of its drivers driving SUVs, okay? 30% of the people actually drive SUVs. But when I take a random sample, because it's random, and I, you never know what you're going to get when it's random, I happened to get a sample that either had too many SUV drivers or too few SUV drivers. So maybe I took a sample and my sample showed only 20% driving SUVs. Okay, so I selected 100 random people from the population and 20 out of these 100 people drive SUVs. And when I do the math, it's uh, the probability, my p-value is 0.0417. Okay, so that led me to conclude that the population actually is not 30% as, uh, SUV drivers. But in reality, it is 30% SUV drivers. Okay. Am, I, am I losing you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes? No? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what's happening, okay, because remember, the population is some entity, and we can't survey everybody in the population. Okay. All right, so maybe here's a better example. Okay, let's say in the United States, let's say it's truly 50% male and 50% female, okay? 50% male, 50% female. If I take a random sample, if I take a random sample of, let's say, uh, 30 people, maybe I get, um, uh, I could get 12 males and 18 females, right? If I just take a random sample, I could get 12 males and 18 females. According to my sample, 12 divided by 30 is 40% male, right? So if, I've now, if I don't know anything about the United States, and, uh, and I'm looking at this random sample, I might come to the conclusion that, oh, you know what? The United States is actually not 50% male and 50% female, but it's actually less, less than 50% male because my sample showed 40% male. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I did my hypothesis test, maybe I come to the conclusion that the United States is less than 50% male. But in reality, it is actually 
50-50. It's actually 50% male, 50% female. But because of my random sample, my random sample misleading me, I think the United States is less than 50% male. Okay? And that could happen anytime you do a hypothesis test. And anytime you do a hypothesis test, it's possible that the null hypothesis is actually true. The proportion is 30% or the proportion is 50%. Whatever it, the null hypothesis, whatever it is, could actually be true, but because of your sample, you've made the wrong conclusion. You've made a conclusion, but your conclusion was wrong. Sometimes, mistakes that we can make, and this is one of them, and we gave it a very creative name. It's called the type 1 error. So we, so we do not reject the null hypothesis, and that is also a mistake. Okay, and that's known as a type 2 error. Sometimes you reject the null when it's actually true, and the other times you don't reject the null when you're supposed to reject it. Type 1 and type 2 error. So let's 
let's talk about what it means to commit a type 1 or type 2 error. So let's say uh, so today on uh, today's quiz we saw two proportion hypothesis tests. Okay. But we might see uh, and on future and on the final you might see two sample mean hypothesis tests, right? Okay. So on that one, I would say uh, what is the um, say we measure the, uh, the time it takes for someone to take a shower. We're going to have two groups, okay? Group one, as we uh, take a sample of, uh, let's, let's say, uh, 30, 30 men, and the average uh, time to shower was, I don't know, 10.3 minutes, okay, with standard deviation. I'm just making up numbers. All right, and then group two, uh, let's say we took uh, sampled 40 women. I want their average time to shower. 50. <laughs> okay, average shower time, uh, let's, let's say 13.8 minutes, who knows, okay? Showers are like five minutes, like half an hour. Huh? Half an hour, okay. So, standard deviation of six minutes, okay, we'll say. So, more and more, uh, some, some, some people take longer showers, who knows, okay. Okay, so in this context, now we ask, do we have evidence? that um, women take longer showers than men. Okay. What does it mean to commit a type 1 error in this scenario? And what does it mean to commit a type 2 error in this scenario? If we rejected that woman, longer showers than men. Okay, so hang on, hang on. All right, and then second, what does it mean? So in order for us to answer this question, we have to know what the null and alternative hypotheses are. Correct. All right. So what are my null and alternative hypotheses? So my null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 equals 0. And the alternative, mu1 minus mu2 Less than zero. Okay. This is my null and alternative. Because I'm saying, do we have evidence that women take longer showers than men? So if women is group two, the length of the men's shower minus the women's shower should be negative. This would be two sample means. Two sample means. Okay. We could actually run through this, but we'll probably do a bunch of these next week. All right, but what does it mean to commit a type one error in this situation? If we rejected that the times were equal, 
Okay, so this means we've rejected the null when the null is true. Okay, so type 1, reject the null. So in this context, rejecting the null means what? We believe that Okay, yes. So our conclusion is we believe women take longer showers. But the truth is what? The truth is they do not, right? The truth is their shower length is the same. that women take longer showers. Oh wait, to say, say that they are equal, they are equal but when women actually take more? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's not that we're saying they are equal. We're just saying we don't have evidence. We don't have evidence, we don't have evidence that women take longer showers, but the truth is, is they do take longer showers, okay? So type 2 error. Okay, so uh, is we do not have evidence. showers. a little bit more. Okay. What is the probability of committing a type 1 error? The probability of committing a type 1 error is something that we've seen many times, but it's alpha, okay? So when you pick alpha is equal to 5%, you are accepting basically a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. Because we say whenever you get a p-value of 5% or less, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. But when you get a p-value of, let's say, 4%, that means there is a 4% chance that you got this p-value just by random chance. Okay, so when you pick alpha is equal to 5% and you say, I'm going to reject whenever alpha is 5% or less, you are inherently accepting a 5% risk of a type 1 error. So when alpha equals 0.05, there is a 0.05 chance of committing a type 1 error.
The probability of committing a type 2 error uh, can actually be calculated. Okay, so with alpha, we just pick alpha for our problems, right? Or alpha is given to us. Probability of a type 2 error can be calculated, but it's a rather uh, involved calculation process, and I'm not going to uh, teach it to you guys, all right? But you do need to know, all right, so I'm not going to teach you guys how to calculate it yourself, but you do need to know that the probability of a type 2 error has a symbol, and that symbol is beta. Okay? So alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. So alpha goes with type 1, first letter, and beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet, and that goes with type 2. Okay? And alpha looks like the letter A, and beta looks like the letter B. So type 1, the first letter, letter number 1, A. Type 2, letter number 2 is B. Okay? The probability of a type 2 error is beta. Okay. And then we give a special name to something called, or to the quantity, 1 minus beta. Okay. Whenever you do 1 minus a probability, what is that the probability of? No, that's one larger. Whole. That's that's for the... Uh, whole. Huh? 1 minus probability is going to double. Huh? Of it not being the probability? Yeah. It's, when we call that the... Does anyone remember? No. So this might... Maybe, 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 maybe not. Okay. 1 minus the probability is something that the probability be complement. Good. Okay. So this is the complement of a type 1 error, okay? So let's see, this is the probability of the complement, or complement of a type 2 error, sorry. Okay, or probability of not committing a type 2 error. So what does it mean to not commit a type 2 error? To commit type 1 error? No. Nope. <laughs> okay, so elaborate a little bit more. So the probability of not committing a type one error, type two error. So type two error is what? It means you did what? You accepted the null. You did not reject the null. That's you false. did not reject yeah. the null when the, the null is false. when the null is false. Okay. So what is not doing that? The probability that the null is not that the null is true. You reject it. You will. No, reject it. When it's not accepted. When it's false. Yes. So this, the complement of a type 2 error is making the correct decision to reject the null when the null is false. Okay? The correct decision. So this is the probability of correctly rejecting the null when the null is false. Okay, so when you're supposed to reject the null, what's the probability that you actually do reject the null? That's this quantity here. And that, we give it a special name and that's power. So the power of a test, okay? Basically, how good is this test at getting you to reject the null when the null is false. Okay. Yes? Sir. Where can I find in the book um, this in the chapter? At, at the end of chapter 9. At the end of chapter 9. There's no calculation for this step. Uh, what? There's no calculation for this uh, yeah. For this step, yeah, this part, there's no calculations per se, but it, it is intuitive, like, you got to think about it, right? you gotta, you got to think about these things, okay? So the power of a test is the probability of correctly rejecting the null when the null is false, okay? So what do you think is one way to just increase the power of a test? Increase the sample? Sample size. Sample size. So if we gather more data, that will help us, that will increase the power. And then another way, which might be considered cheating, is just to 
uh, increase your alpha. Okay. If you uh, if you pick alpha 10%, you're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis a lot more, and so you'll be <laughs> correctly rejecting the null hypothesis more also. <laughs> but if we just increased alpha, what do you think will happen? We're committing type 1 errors a lot more also. Okay. So there's this uh, relationship. If we don't gather any more data, I'm sorry? Oh, you don't want me to erase this? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, so if, if we do not gather any more data, side, decreasing alpha, will increase beta. What do you mean by additional and gathering additional data? So like, if your sample size, like if your original data has a sample size of 20, and you just keep it that, okay? So if we, you don't say like, oh, you know, Maybe you run through it and it says you don't have enough evidence of, to reject the null. Okay, so at this point you might say, oh, I need to gather more evidence or I need to gather more data. Okay, but if you don't, but that would increase your sample size. And decrease power, right? Yeah, and decrease power. specified, just assume alpha is 5%. But the problem might say use alpha 1% or use alpha 10% or use alpha 3% or something, okay? You might get to pick the alpha yourself, okay? When do you think you'd want a uh, big uh, alpha and when do you think you'd want a small alpha? decrease beta, but it increases your type 1 error, right? Increasing alpha inherently increases your risk of type 1 error. So, hmm? so the, reason, the reason we use the alpha we do, is that because it's like the lowest of control, or? Uh, the reason we use the alpha that we do is probably because we have five fingers on our hand. And, uh, uh, I'm not totally, I'm not kidding about it. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of this, uh, it's, a, it's like an arbitrary number that has been decided, um, but it's kind of been established in the literature for a long time, right? Why, why is it that at age 18 you can enlist in the army and buy cigarettes? It's just a, it's an arbitrary number that the government has decided, but it's kind of been established, and, and that's what we go with. Okay, so uh, I mean, they, he asked why, I don't know, right? Um, so five percent, it's kind of, it's an arbitrary number, but it's kind of been established. But you can pick an ar another number, right? You can go to Canada, and uh, and it's <laughs> age 19 where uh, you can start drinking and you have all the rights of an adult and whatever, but is that a better number or worse number than 18? No, okay, There's, it's just it's just a number. So if somebody says, I want to use 4% rather than 5%, 
That's fine. That's fine. It's just it's just different from what we're used to. Okay. So anyway, um, but sometimes yeah, people will say I want to use alpha ten percent, or someone else might say I want to use alpha one percent. When do we want these different alphas? So let's think of. Let me just think of a different. Uh, let me make up a situation. Okay. So let's say um, you are a smoke alarm. Okay, or fire fire alarm. A smoke detector. What what is your job as a smoke detector? To, to, to make noise when. Okay, so smoke. you're supposed to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to make noise, sound so an alarm when there smoke. is smoke or when there's fire. Okay, and what's your other job? To detect the smoke. <laughs> it's so obvious that you probably won't think of it. Turn on. So, no, 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 no. You're just, uh, you're just a beeping thing, okay? You're just this little round thing up on the ceiling. All you can do is, do I smell smoke? No, 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 that's not your job. No, okay. You're making it too complicated. Your, your number one job, sound an alarm when you detect smoke. Your number two job, to not. To be quiet when there's no smoke. Oh. Okay, and it seems so obvious. <laughs> but if you have if you have an alarm that's not doing job number two, you're gonna throw that alarm away, right? Okay. If it's just making noise when there's no fire, you're gonna be like, I gotta get rid of this. Thing. Okay. All right. So the fire alarm or smoke smoke alarm, whatever it is. Okay. Two jobs. Okay. Make uh, make noise when there's fire. And be quiet when there's no fire. Alright, I'm sure there's you can get fancy ones that call the cops and whatever. Okay. Or call the fire department. <laughs> things like that. They call your house. Have you detected your smoke alarm went off? Is everything okay? <laughs> Um, so this this happens and uh, okay, but if from the fire alarm's perspective, you can think of there being a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. What's the null hypothesis? Remember, we're always gathering evidence to support the alternative. There isn't a fire. So the null hypothesis is that there is no fire. And the alternative is that. There is a fire. There is a fire. All right. What is a type one error in this context? Saying there is a fire when there isn't. So there is a fire when there is no fire. So type one error is the alarm says there's a fire when there really is no fire. Okay. So uh, so there is alarm without a fire. And what is a type 2 error? No alarm with a fire. Yeah, this is a fire without an alarm. So in this context, which error is worse? Yeah, type two error is worse, much worse than type one error. Okay. So type one error is annoying, but type two error could potentially be tragic. Okay. So in this case, we want, we prefer, if we were to make a mistake, we prefer to make type one over type two. Okay. If we, if we were, if we had to make a choice in be, be, between mistakes, about, let me just write type two error worse than type one. Always <laughs> or just in this case? Just in this scenario, okay. So in this scenario, type 2 error is worse than type 1. So would we prefer to choose a large alpha or small alpha? Large alpha. Yeah, we pick a large alpha, okay. So we pick... So why do we pick a large alpha just in case? 
because the large alpha decreases, decreases beta, okay? Increasing alpha decreases beta, so that means we reduce our type 2 error and increase our type 1 error, okay? And, uh, and this is actually, like, if you buy, maybe not a fire uh, smoke alarm, but if you buy a carbon monoxide detector, okay, it's actually very similar to this situation, right? There's lots, there's dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, or there is not dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, and things like that. Um, it will actually, most uh, detectors will say, uh, this carbon monoxide detector is made to be very, very sensitive, and, uh, and the proper procedures in the instruction manuals, a lot of times will say, if it goes off, hit the reset, wait an hour, and if it goes off again, then evacuate the house, but if it doesn't go off, the first one was probably just a false alarm, okay? And that's, be that's because they make the thing so sensitive that anything, it's like they've picked such a high alpha that anything could trigger it and cause it to reject the null and it essentially cause an alarm. So an hour of breathing in carbon monoxide is all right? I mean, right? It's, it's so, um, the carbon monoxide detectors are so sensitive yeah. that like when it trips it, um, like you can sit around for an hour and it probably will not be harmful to you, yeah. okay? okay. And, and if it goes off again, then you probably actually have some kind of problem and you could probably stick around even longer, but it's uh, not advisable. Whereas a lot of times it might just be a false alarm. Yes. So if we pick a larger alpha, does it mean that now the, the beta, beta goes down. make it less possible? No. The beta, no. Uh, <laughs> larger alpha means more type 1 error, but less type 2 error. Okay. So All meaning right. because it's dangerous, we don't want it to have less yeah, type Yeah. Type, in this case, type 2 error is worse than a type 1. Okay. So uh, can you think of another, a situation where a type 1 error is worse than a type 2? Okay, so let's, uh, this is, uh, the justice system that we have in our uh -huh. country is set up this way, okay? Maybe not all countries, but uh, in America, America, where we love freedom. We're supposed um, to. Okay, we're supposed to, right, exactly. <laughs> okay. But, uh, okay, so in this case, you know, at Cops isn't on the show anymore, but uh, on the t on the TV anymore. But um, at the end of every show, what do they say? They say, uh, you know, all suspects arrested or whatever are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? So in this case, and and we say the onus of proof falls upon the prosecution, meaning that we gather evidence in order to bring about a guilty conviction. Okay? We don't try to say, okay, now you have to bring forth a lot of evidence to prove that you're innocent. It doesn't work that way here, okay? We, you have to bring evidence to show that someone is guilty. So in this case, what is in the null hypothesis and what's the alternative? You are innocent. Okay, the null hypothesis is person is innocent. Person is or, innocent. Uh, or defendant, mm -hmm. I should say. Defendant is innocent. Uh, 
death penalty reform. And this was the biggest argument for death penalty reform. Okay. Type two error is what? The defendant is guilty. You can't prove it. Yeah, defendant is guilty, but uh, not enough guilt to bring about a conviction. So, so, uh, but is acquitted. Yeah, much more. Okay, and and this brings up a good point that even if you do not reject the null hypothesis. It doesn't prove that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so we never. So that's why it's important that we say we don't accept the null hypothesis. We just say we do not reject the null hypothesis. And and this is it's the same in uh, in our court system that if somebody um, if somebody is uh, acquitted on a uh, on a trial, it doesn't prove that that person is innocent. It just means you, that the prosecution or whatever uh, didn't have present enough evidence or strong enough case to bring about a conviction. Okay, and so uh, the way uh, our justice system is set up, which error is is worse than the other? The type one. Type one error is much worse than the type two error. Okay. Ideally, we would not make any kind of mistakes, but but inevitably uh, we do make mistakes. So. We said if we're going to make a mistake, we prefer to make type two errors than type one errors. So in this case, would we pick a large alpha or a small alpha? A small, small alpha. A very small alpha. A very small alpha. So in this case, type one error is worse than type two. Okay. So we pick a small alpha. Actually, say this uh, in, uh, in in the court. Okay, they don't say uh, jury pick a small alpha in your decision making process. But what do they say? <laughs> they say yeah. yeah. Make sure that the evidence presented uh, brings you uh, to uh, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, regarding the, uh, the conviction. Because they don't they don't want somebody to just Say, mm, I got a hunch that this person is guilty, so we're we're saying guilty. Okay, they want you to be absolutely sure that someone is guilty before you say guilty. Okay, so they say beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. Uh, should we just keep powering through, and uh, rather than take a break? Okay, so we'll do that. Will we end early? If that's yeah, okay. we'll probably end a little bit early. Huh? No, don't don't hold your breath, okay? <laughs> Answer and then I'll, ha I'll have a question like, what does it mean to commit a type 1 error in this scenario or something like that? Okay. Or what does it mean to commit a type 2 error? Something like that. Okay, so with chapter 12, uh, we have to talk about sampling methods. supposed to do is check to make sure that the conditions are met. Okay? The way I've got the test set up, uh, I have questions, separate questions on for you to check conditions, and then um, for the actual problems or calculations, all the conditions are met. Okay? So I don't want anybody to just say, <laughs> no conditions are met, so I'm not going to do any of the calculations here. So. <laughs> 
before the final, you're going to have also like a, your hours? No, I, I don't have office hours on the day of the final. Okay, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> early. It's like, oh, hello, who are you? <laughs> like, and suddenly, like, everybody comes out of the woodwork and shows up for, for that particular so episode. So any questions we have, we should have them. Yeah, come, get, be prepared for next class, yeah. Are you going to offer me my day? No. Oh, oh yeah, so no? What's my day? Like, so like oh, it's my day class, before class, right, yeah. Or any time, like, in between the class uh, so you can post questions on Facebook and stuff, and I'll, I'll try to get them answered. I mean, if you post them on the day of the final, I probably can't. Wait, but on Monday, next Monday, we don't have a test, or uh, you don't have hours then? No, I'm, but I'm not at campus on Monday, so. Not Monday, sorry. Tuesday, next before Tuesday. Class. Oh, yeah, yeah, next Tuesday, I'll, I'll have, uh, I'll have um, hours before okay. class. Yeah. Okay, so sampling methods. So most of the time, so one of the conditions is that uh, that the sample is selected randomly or independent. Okay, sample is random and independent. Okay, this is a, a condition. Condition for inference. The truth is, getting a <laughs> random sample is actually very challenging to pull off. So the, uh, the best way to get a random sample is through simple random sample, okay? Simple random sampling are known as SRS. Is the best way to yeah this is the best way for a random sample okay this is a this is truly a random sample a truly random sample but how do how does one do simple random sampling okay what simple random sampling requires and what makes it so challenging is it requires a list of every single person or every single thing in the population, okay? Uh, simple SRS requires a, uh, a list of everyone in the population. Okay, this is known as the sampling. Simple random samples uh, work well for institutions like a school, a university, or a corporation where they do have a list of everybody. So a company will have a list of everyone who works for it. A school will have a list of everyone enrolled, things like that, okay? It doesn't work well for, I would say, government things, okay? So like the United States does not have a list of every single person in the United States. We try really hard every 10 years with the census, but the ne very next day, new people have been born and some people have died, and so that the list that they spent worked so hard gathering is now obsolete, okay? So uh, a simple random sample um, is really hard. Even, you know, city of Los Angeles, do we have a list of every single person in the definitely city? No, not. definitely not, right? <laughs> okay, so only, only, uh, so it's it's really hard to do, okay? So uh, so that's hard, okay? But the way it works is if you do have the list, all you do is you just number every single person on the list, draw random numbers, and those are the people that go in the sample, okay? So uh, once you have your list, once the uh, list is obtained, uh, assign uh, assign random numbers.
example of this would be uh, a university you know, takes its list of 5,000 students and it randomly selects 100 students and uses that for a, as a random sample. size of the population? 5,000. 5, so in order for the big population condition to be met, the population has to be 10 times, times bigger than the sample. Than sample. So the sample cannot be any bigger than 500, right? So and it randomly selects whatever, we'll say 300 students. students, that would be the absolute largest sample they can select. Okay, I'm going to just slide that up. city of Los Angeles, what would we do? Maybe we'd use the phone book, but then we would miss every single person that doesn't is not listed in the phone book, which would be probably every single one of you, okay? Any, anyone here listed in the phone book? No. No, right? I can use this then. okay. So it doesn't work, we don't have a whole list? Yeah, if you don't have a list of every single person in the population, you cannot do simple random sample. I mean, you could try, but it's not going to work. It's going to give you a simple random sample of your list. That's a simple random sample of this. OK, so there's a couple other methods that, um, that we use. One is stratified sampling. Okay. So there's stratified sampling, and then there's cluster sampling. And for whatever reason, students have a tough time distinguishing stratified sampling from cluster sampling. And okay. this is for, this is for that, that example then? Wait, These are kidding. other sampling methods, okay? okay. So, it's so right. if you cannot do simple random sampling, you're probably gonna have to resort to another sampling method, okay. okay? And one is stratified sampling, and the other is cluster sampling, okay? Actually, if you can't do simple random sampling, you probably can't do stratified sampling. But some people will try it, okay? Some people will like try it. Huh? Is so that a role? Or huh? Can you say it always like that, that or sometimes? No, 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 okay. So these are just, just write down that these are different sampling methods, okay? So you don't, don't worry about this if you can't pull out simple random and then you're going to do this or something, okay? But people, I don't know, students have a tough time telling these two apart. So I'm going to kind of try to. Explain one and explain the other. Okay. In stratified sampling, the population is divided into subgroups. Okay. okay. 
but each of the subgroups share a common trait or are somewhat homogeneous. Okay? These subgroups um, are, are made of individuals that share a common trait. Proportions of each subgroup is known for the population. Okay, so uh, we know the proportions of each subgroup Select our sample to match the proportions in the population. Do uh, an example. So here's an example is that so let's say at uh, Ten percent are Latino, ten uh, percent are black, and, uh, and the remaining five percent uh, are you know mixed race or other. Okay. Whatever. Okay, so this is uh, these are I'm just making up numbers here. <coughs> But let's say these are the proportions that exist uh, at UCLA. Okay, so we've got subgroups, and in the subgroups, the the students share a common trait. In this case, it's their, their race or ethnicity. Okay, so it would be race. That's the uh, shared trait. Okay, and so when we pick a sample, we pick a sample so that. Uh, the sample has the same proportions that exist in the population. Okay, so if I pick, if my sample is 100 people, how many people would I pick to be Latino. 10, 10%? 10 out of the 100, 10% of the 100, so 10. 10 people, I would pick uh, 10 Latino people to be in the population. Or, uh, and I would pick uh, 35 people that are Asian and 40 people that are white and, and so on and so forth, okay? So that the sample is like a mini version of UCLA in terms, of, at least for this aspect of Race. Okay, it's 
So that's, that's stratified sampling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cluster sampling. Okay, the population, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, over here, it's called stratified sampling because the subgroups are called strata. The subgroups are called strata. Subgroups don't necessarily share a common trait, okay? Like, like over here. And the uh, the key difference here is it is easy to get a list of all the clusters. Okay, or it is relatively easy all the clusters. Okay. And the sampling, the way the sampling works here is we randomly select some of the clusters. And once we've selected the clusters, we look at everybody in the selected clusters. Select um, some of the clusters. So an example would be, um, let's say we wanted to get a random sample of all the people that attend a Jewish synagogue. Okay? If we wanted to do simple random sampling, we would require a list of what? I'll remember. Of every single person who attends Jewish synagogue. Okay? That list would be very incredibly difficult to obtain. Okay? But um, we can do a cluster sampling relatively easy. Okay? It would be easy, a lot easier, to get a list of all the Jewish synagogues that exist in Los Angeles, right? So I, I don't know how many there are. Let's say there's uh, 100. Okay? From, that, from the list of the 100 synagogues, I can randomly select Ten of them, okay. And once I've identified uh, the ten synagogues, then I go to those ten that I've selected and uh, survey everyone uh, 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 at the synagogue. Okay. So I can, I could maybe uh, the synagogue might have a list of regular attendees or something like that, and I want to get um, a list that way. Okay. It's not a convenient sample because there is a random element to it where you've got a list of all the synagogues and you're, you're randomly selecting 10, okay? Or you're getting a list of all the clusters and you're randomly selecting a certain number of them, okay? So it's not convenience because convenience just means you just do whatever you want, okay? So, and we're not just 
picking the 10 uh, synagogues that are convenient for us to go to, we're just selecting, uh, we're randomly selecting them. Yes? So the difference between the two, mm -hmm. so is yeah. that basically the cluster assembly, you're collecting groups but all from the same thing, and all the same amount from each 